be talking about near-death experiences today and uh, some of the latest research that I've been doing involving near-death experience. We've heard from several speakers already that near-death experiences are among the strongest evidence that we have of survival. I couldn't agree more details coming right up here. What exactly is a near-death experience? I know most of you know a lot about near-death experience, but just so that we're all on the same page, at least for my research purposes, I look for two things in a near-death experience. You're near death, and that is you're so physically compromised that you're unconscious or may even be clinically dead, absent heartbeat, absent spontaneous respiration. You're unconscious at this point in time, and so by dictionary definition, you shouldn't have any experience when you're that close to death, and yet they do. They have the experience part of a near-death experience, and we'll talk more about what the common elements are in just a minute here. I want to emphasize no two near-death experiences are the same, but when you study many near-death experiences, you can see this kind of spectrum of elements typically occurring in this order, but not necessarily. Often early in the experience, there's what's called an out-of-body experience. They have that life-threatening event. Consciousness leaves the body, typically goes above it, not always, may go level with body, rarely even below the level of the body. There's heightened senses. Uh, they may have uh, vision or hearing that's super normal. There's intense and generally positive feelings. Peace and love are the two most uh, common words used to describe a near-death experience as part of the intensity of these emotions, typically described as unearthly in their intensity. They may pass into or through a tunnel. Uh, often at the end of the tunnel is a mystical, brilliant light, and then at, in an unearthly realm, they may encounter uh, mystical beings or deceased relatives. We'll be talking about that a little bit later. They, they almost always have a sense of altered time or space. Typically with near-death experiences, uh, almost uniformly they'll say time doesn't exist. Time is not like it is in our earthly, everyday life. They may see all or a part of their prior life in the life review, uh, encounter unearthly, uh, heavenly realms, if you will, uh, learn special knowledge. Uh, often there's a barrier, which means near the end of the experience they may have a choice to come back to their earthly life or stay in this unearthly, beautiful realm. Interestingly, the great majority of people that have near-death experiences, when they're at that boundary and they're involved in a decision, want to stay in that unearthly realm. They do not want to go back to their earthly life, even though that's been familiar for years to decades of all their existence up until then. And then they return to their body, either voluntarily or, or involuntarily. Well, a little bit about uh, hearing my first near-death experience. Again, I'm Dr. Jeffrey Long. I'm a physician. Um, my medical practice is radiation oncology, and it was many decades ago that I was back in the days when we had paper journals, remember that, instead of reading it online, but I was actually looking up in the <coughs> Journal of the American Medical Association an article about cancer as part of my training, and right in that article's uh, top line, it had the term near-death experience, which I had never heard. I was fascinated, stopped looking for that article, and read the article, and was immediately fascinated. Folks, I mean, how can you not be interested in what happens when we die? I was amazed when I read that article and thought, after reading my very first article, first exposure to near-death experience, if this is for real, this changes my view of the universe. Consciousness, if you will. This changed everything. Well, many years later, I'm a little bit of a computer geek, I was able to set up a website, the Near-Death Experience Research Foundation, and from the very inception of this website, I had a very detailed questionnaire asking people to share not only a narrative of their experience, but answer many, which is now up to over 140 questions about their experience so that we could learn uh, about it. And that started my uh, NDE research. I want to emphasize it's a public service. Uh, we really have not solicited funds for that, um, and we've, uh, we're all entirely self-funded. Now, that was a long time ago, in August 1998, that Enderf became a live website. And amazingly, over the years, we've now accrued over 4,000 near-death experiences that are posted on the website, making this obviously by far the largest publicly accessible database of near-death experiences in the world, uh, which has been an inspiration to a vast number of people. Uh, I want to say at the beginning of this talk here, it's a basic scientific principle that what is real is consistently observed. And I'm about to describe some striking consistencies and consistent observations in near-death experiences out of thousands that have led me to firmly believe that near-death experiences and their consistent message of, if you will, survival is the real thing. And I have to emphasize special thanks to my wife, Jody. 
She's a licensed attorney, but is so fascinated and interested in the work that we do. Uh, really, it's a soul calling, I think, for both of us. So even though she's a licensed attorney, she does not practice law and devotes her full time, uh, probably full time and a half, to these web near-death experience and research-related activities that we do. I could not do it without Jody. So yeah, no big thanks. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, it's for real. So big thanks to Jody. Well, what if, who has a near-death experience anyway? A Gallup poll published in 1982 suggested perhaps as many as 5% of the adults in the United States had had a near-death experience. Well, the bottom line, we can't really predict at the time of a life-threatening event who will have a near-death experience or what the content of a near-death experience will be. Near-death experiences can happen to children, adults, physicians, scientists. Uh, we've had near-death experiences from the clergy, the religious, atheists, and even many people who have never heard of a near-death experience and believe no such thing is possible have a near-death experience and then later share it with us. I want to emphasize that the great majority of people that have that close brush with death do not have a near-death experience. Only about 10 to 20 percent of those who nearly die have a near-death experience and technically we don't know exactly why certain people have a near-death experience and why don't. Although. If there's some interest in that, we had a very interesting near-death experience where we may have an answer to that question. Well, the bottom line is anyone can have a near-death experience. Oh boy, here we go. Okay, here's what the skeptics think we do. This right here is a fake near-death kit, and there's your light, and there's your tongue. Okay, I have great news. We don't do our NDE research this way. I don't think anybody else does either, but I think the skeptics believe that we do, so there you go. Moving on rapidly. Um, my first book I published was some years ago, uh, Evidence of the Afterlife, the Science of Near-Death Experience. And, uh, I worked my tail off to do that. I have a very busy medical practice, but somehow found the time to do that. And oops, eight days later, it was a New York Times bestseller, which substantially changed my life. And I've been on all sorts of media. It was, I was prouder to be on the O'Reilly Factor until recent events and the troubles we had. But it's been a very fun and very enjoyable. I was honored to be invited to the talk at the New York Academy of Science, but it's been a real adventure and I've had an opportunity literally to talk to tens of millions of people in various media events about near-death experiences in my research and uh, we'll get into that shortly. Now I practice in Homa, Louisiana, which you probably never heard of because it's a town of 32,000 that is about an hour away from Louisiana and interestingly even a little bit south of Louisiana. So even from that small town, which is very conservative from a religious point of view, I was thrilled to find that there was extraordinary local interest. People love this. I talked to all sorts of groups down there. And it turned out to be a very, very positive part of uh, my experience down there and actually helped my medical practice and helped make me swamped. That's another story. Well, anyway, we're going to get into the evidence that was in that first book that I wrote. That had nine lines of evidence. The survey, the largest survey we had up to that time, had 617 respondents uh, from our online survey. These are sequentially shared near-death experiences, so there's no file drawer effect. But we're going to go over all these nine lines of evidence that I think certainly have convinced me and I think a lot of other people, and certainly those that have had near-death experiences, that, that, that uh, near-death experiences are indeed evidence of an afterlife, survival of consciousness, if you will, that they certainly bespeak their reality. So let's dive right into it. Um, Ed Kelly said that there were two aspects of near-death experience that he thought was very evidential. One was near-death experiences during cardiac arrest when consciousness should not exist, and the second being under general anesthesia. We're going to hit both of those, but first let's talk about what happens when you have a cardiac arrest. When you have a cardiac arrest, your heart stops beating. Immediately when your heart stops beating, blood stops going up to your brain. 10 to 20 seconds after blood stops flowing to your brain at the time of a cardiac arrest, EEG measure of cortical brain electrical activity is absolutely flat. It should be absolutely at that, possible at that time to have a conscious lucid experience. And yet, by the scores, we have near-death experiences over the years describing that out-of-body experience consciousness over their body while they are, by all clinical measures, dead with an absent heartbeat, and yet there they are with a lucid organized experience and what they're observing later verified. Um, I asked in a survey question, about their level of consciousness and alertness. Surely after they're un physically unconscious or clinically dead, uh, that should alter their level of consciousness. But paradoxically, among those that had near-death experiences and responded to the survey question, 
Uh, nearly three-fourths said they were actually, during the experience, having more consciousness and alertness than usual. Only about 20% said normal consciousness and alertness. And even though they're physically unconscious, look at that, only 5% said that their experience involved them with less consciousness than, again, comparison to their earthly, everyday life. Near-death experiences seem to be a very special type of memory. They're remembered verbatim years to decades later, and that's been proven in several good prospective studies. Um, the second thing that I think is fascinating about near-death experiences, we heard about out-of-body experiences. Well, uh, that's very common in near-death experiences to have that separation of consciousness go above the physical body, and then they can see and hear ongoing earthly events while they're unconscious or clinically dead. Uh, about 45% of near-death experiences describe ongoing earthly events as part of their NDE. My research question is very simple. What they're seeing when their consciousness is apart from their body, is it real? Is it validated? Well, there was a good prospective study by Sabom and Sartari that uh, suggested that what they were observing was certainly very accurate. And there's a Dr. Jan Holden who reviewed all NDE literature up to her publication some years ago and found that 92% of these out-of-body observations described during near-death experiences were without any accuracy. She'd call them inaccurate if there was even a single detail that didn't jibe with consensus reality. And for my study, we found 287 near-death experiences that described these out-of-body observations. My researcher's question, very simple, was it absolutely accurate verbatim? And I found 97.6 of these out-of-body observations or without any apparent inaccuracy whatsoever. And this includes, remarkably, people that have their consciousness separate from the body and then travel a considerable distance from the physical body far outside of any physical awareness. We actually had pre uh, presented on television a case report of this type of phenomenon where the person coded in the operating room, had a near-death experience, consciousness left the operating room arena, and went down into the hospital cafeteria. From that vantage point, he was able to see and hear what his family members were talking about while he was under anesthesia, while he was coded in a completely different part of the hospital. What he saw and heard verbatim accurate down to fine details. That is anecdotal, but that is not a rare phenomenon in Indies at all. We have scores and scores of near-death experiences with that same type of phenomenon absolutely inexplicable by brain function as we know it today, by physical brain function. Uh, oh, here we go again. Okay, well, all right, if you are reading this, so here's, here's how we don't do research again for everybody who walks out of the room and says, who, who invited this guy? So we don't do this. Okay, here's an operating room, and uh, so you can, there have been some interest in placing targets for uh, prospective NDE study, but that's not exactly how it's done. That's the good news. So moving on, once again, moving along rapidly. Well, a line of evidence number three are near-death experiences in the blind. Uh, I had the opportunity, well, blind is different, there's different types of blindness. You can be born blind or develop blindness later in life. You can be totally blind or partially blind. The sternest test, obviously, would be someone born totally blind. Well, enter Vicky, who I interviewed, who was uh, born at 26 uh, weeks gestation back in the 50s. They put them in oxygen tents and basically fried the retina, leaving them totally blind uh, from early infancy. We don't do that anymore, but suffice it to say, Vicky, totally blind throughout life, uh, was involved in a car crash. And I know what you're thinking. No, she wasn't driving. She was a singer and very talented, and she was being driven home by an inebriated patron who crashed. And uh, for the first time, she had vision unlike anything she'd had in her life. She was physically over her body while it was in a gurney in the emergency room. And you could just imagine her first reaction to that kind of vision. Well, you probably can't. I didn't. She was horrified. Vision was so unknown and unfamiliar to her, it, it scared her. And it was only after a while that she correlated her long hair, which she knew by a sense of feel. And interestingly, her father had given her a ring, which she only knew again by sense of feel that she now was able to see. So for, when she went through and had a stunningly detailed near-death experience, her vision in it was uh, what's uh, often observed in near-death experience, 360-degree vision, which is uh, actually a more correct term would be spherical, up, down, right, left, um, forward and backward, basically processing a spherical visual field all simultaneously. It was fascinating to me to talk to Vicky and explain that our visual field was pie-shaped. And I still do, I don't even know if she ever believed me, because for some total of having detailed vision was spherical, as so many near-death experiences report. 
Well, certainly, uh, we now have asked in the most recent version of our questionnaire for near-death experiencers the difference between their earthly everyday vision and their vision during NDEs. We now have a series that we're developing of people that were either se severely visually impaired or actually blind and had an NDE. But let's give an example of that. Marta, Marta shared her NDE, and this is a portion of the narrative. Uh, Marta was a five-year-old girl, and parents don't ever let your kids go out in a lake if they're blind. Here's what can happen. Marta's own words, by the way, I slowly breathed in the water and immediately lost consciousness. A beautiful woman dressed in bright white light pulled me out and looking into my eyes asked me what I wanted. I was completely satisfied and could think of nothing until it occurred to me to take a trip around the lake. I did so and saw a detail I would have never seen in real life. I could go anywhere, even to the tops of trees, by simply intending to do so. I was legally blind, and for the first time, I saw leaves on trees, birds' feathers, birds' eyes, details on telephone poles, and in people's backyards that was far more acute than 2020 vision. Things we take for granted, birds' feathers, birds' eyes, telephone poles, fascinating if you've never seen it before in your life, as was true for Marta during her near-death experience at the age of five. But a fourth line of evidence, again, at uh, Kelly talked about a very powerful and persuasive line of evidence. So what about near-death experiences that occur while you're under general anesthesia? It helps for me to be a physician when reading these accounts. I know darn good and well what kind of surgeries are done under general anesthesia, uh, anesthesia and which ones possibly surgery may potentially be done under local anesthesia. So I found 23 uh, experiences of, from near, of near death experiences were clearly under general anesthesia at the time they had their experience. Of course, don't forget, under general anesthesia, they're very careful to monitor heartbeat, and uh, very, if, you get a, if you code during a uh, operation while you're under general anesthesia, it's very well documented. In addition, when you're under general anesthesia, it should be absolutely impossible to have a lucid organized consciousness, and yet they do. I found 23 people that were solidly, convincingly, having their near-death experience at the time they were under general anesthesia. They do occur, and they're typical near-death experiences. And in fact, my survey questionnaire at the time had 33 questions that specifically addressed the content, if you will, the elements of a near-death experience. 32 of the 33 elements comparing the anesthesia NDE group to NDEs occurring under all other circumstances, 32 of the 33 elements occurred equally often. Interestingly, the, those uh, NDEs under anesthesia statistically were more likely to have a tunnel experience. I don't exactly know why. But the critical question I asked about their level of consciousness and alertness compared to their earthly everyday life, the same level of consciousness and alertness, no statistical difference among those having their NDE under anesthesia and those having NDEs under all other circumstances. I submit to you, you could look at that very uh, that single question right there and single-handedly prove that you can have consciousness apart from the physical brain as it's understood. Because these are patients, these are all people that had NDEs, they were coded, and they were under general anesthesia. I submit to you it is doubly impossible to have any kind of memory at that point in time, and yet they did. And that is, I think, single-handedly uh, some of the strongest evidence that you can, near-death experiences are for real, Consciousness could exist apart from the physical brain functioning as is conventionally understood. But there's more. Oh boy, here's another one. Okay, here we go. Here's a, a hey, I have to reassure everybody, I, as a physician, um, lights don't fall from the ceiling in operating rooms and land on patients. So don't worry about this happening. Uh, Ten to one, that when he comes, he'll tell one of those stories about seeing a bright light at the end of the tunnel. Okay, here we go. Once again, the, the addressing the skeptics' uh, thought about how we do NDE research. So anyway, what we got here. Okay, uh, speaking of NDE skeptics, it has been amazing in the over 18 years that I've been doing this research that there have been well over 20, some would argue over 30, different skeptical explanations of near-death experience. Just about any conceivable physiological, psychological, cultural, explanation has been proposed by some skeptic at some time or another. Now, why are, there so, why are there so many different skeptical explanations? The answer is very simple. The skeptics themselves, as a group, are unable to agree on any one or several explanations of near-death experience that make sense even to the skeptics themselves. 
and it goes on and on. Every year a new skeptical explanation is raised and I feel like raising my hand and saying, okay, if your explanation's right, are you gonna tell all these other 20 people that their explanation's wrong? But we haven't had that dialogue, it would be fascinating. But suffice it to say, uh, skeptics can't explain any of the lines of evidence we're going over today, let alone the totality of them. Uh, I just condensed line of evidence for the reality of NDE 5, 6, and 7. Uh, life review, we found it to be so-called perfect playback. During a life review, which only about 15% of people having an NDE have, they may see a part or even all of their prior life. Long forgotten memories may be recalled. I have yet to have a near-death experience where they were aware of a memory from, say, toddlerhood or early childhood that they saw during their life review in an NDE that they later went back and asked often their parents or others to see if it really happened and was told, yes, it did. So even long forgotten memories seem to be uh, remembered and, seen and can be validated by the near-death experiencer after they recover from what nearly killed them. We talked about encountering deceased loved ones. Um, I did a study uh, in my survey, and I was curious. Now, if all other forms of altered consciousness that I'm aware of as a physician, if you encounter another being in that form of altered consciousness, it's going to be like, say, the bank teller you did business with that day or the family member you said hi to before you went up to your bedroom and coded or something. But it's going to be somebody who's alive in the forefront of consciousness. Interestingly, in my study of near-death experiences, um, only 4% of the beings that they encountered were actually alive at the time of their near-death experience. 96% of the time they weren't, and in fact, we have a small series of people that had actually died, uh, but the near-death experiencer did not know they died at the time they had their NDE, and they only found out about it later, and yet there they were, encountering that person who died, and they didn't even know of it during the NDE. And we have a few uh, interesting anecdotal cases of encountering siblings who died that they didn't even know of until they met them in the NDE. And the gender was uh, always accurate, you can validate that. Um, near death, speaking of children, near-death experiences in children are uh, in some way an ideal study group. My study group was people that had their near-death experience age five and younger, median age of th three and a half years old. So these were very young. That young a kid, uh, they're practically, in some significant ways, culturally, a blank slate. They probably don't know much about religion. They don't understand much about death. They've almost certainly not heard about a near-death experience. And yet, when I st surveyed the uh, folks that had NDEs age five and younger versus all other uh, age six and, and older, I found that we talked about those 33 questions pertaining to near-death experience elements. No statistical difference between those two groups of young children and older children and adults. Even very, very young age still seems to not substantially modify the elements that occur with the near-death experience, which is interesting. Now here's an interesting one. Well, what about near-death experiences around the world? Uh, thanks largely to the heroics of Jody, we have the uh, INDERF website translated into amazingly 30 different non-English languages. And by the way, we don't use Google for translation or, or internet sources, all of these are hand translated by volunteers. We've literally had hundreds that have helped us translate portions of the INDERF website, including the survey that we asked, into a huge number of different languages. So we have gotten hundreds of near-death experiences from all around the world, and we can really get our, uh, by the way, when we get a non-English NDE, <coughs> we'll always post it both, uh, and again, they have to give approval to post it, which over 95% of people do, but we then have volunteer human translators translate it and we post both the uh, English translation as well as the original language version of the near-death experience. Uh, we have 70, 80,000 unique visitors on our website a month, so we figure if there's any significant inaccuracies in translation, we'll hear about it. And it's, the translation seems to be very, very good. Well, anyway, this is by far the largest cross-cultural study of near-death experiences ever that was ever even possible. Absolutely, in conclusion, the, the uh, NDE content is strikingly similar, language gets in the way, but uh, even NDEs from non-Western countries appear strikingly similar, and certainly the implications are enormous. All of this evidence is converging on the thought that we are spiritual beings having a human experience here. Now, number nine, both prospective and retrospective studies all find huge changes in the lives of people after they have near-death experiences. They're changed often profoundly, and they're changed over a pro for the rest of their life. Typically, the changes progress. This is just some of a listing of the more common after effects that are, uh, we call them after NDEs. 
Now here's a real interesting one, getting away to my more recent research, here's a question number, a sort of line of evidence number 10. This is real easy. If you want to find out if near-death experience is real, ask our most recent survey, uh, as of the time we closed, closed accrual, had 1,122 people that had responded to it. And we asked them very directly, how do you currently view the reality of your experience? A whopping 95.5% out of the four options declared that their experience was definitely real. Uh, with a much smaller percentage uh, with others of the other three options selected. And I would submit to you, out of respect for people's ability to generally understand reality, if you, skeptics want to represent that near-death experiences are not real, they should present strong evidence that near-death experiences are not real. And as we've discussed, they aren't even close. Line of evidence number 11 is what I call shared near-death experiences. These are two or more people simultaneously with a life-threatening event and uh, they, ha they have both have a near basically a near-death experience and are aware of each other. Um, I have 15 what we call shared near-death experiences. They do occur and they're typical into ease and I can't do better than to give you an example right here. William M, uh, again, his near-death experience. I was taking my girlfriend to, this is in Canada by the way, to her parents' home in Welland. I went to sleep while driving. Then I was aware that we were out of our bodies and quickly flying up towards space holding hands. We flew straight up for a minute or so when we started to see a park or countryside-like landscape. Suddenly, we were intercepted by four creatures. Two flanked each of us and began to gently separate us. They overwhelmed us with the feeling of highest love and compassion that was well beyond anything we could experience on Earth. A divine love. We therefore had no resistance to their effort. I recall feeling sort of like a baby in a mother's arm, but it's hard to accurately describe. Two of them moved her upward toward the distant landscape, and two moved me back downward. I felt so much love, peace, and comfort that I wanted to protest and say, no, please let me hear, but hearing inwardly without ears, or psychically, that I could not stay. Next, I could see my car in flames from maybe a quarter of a mile above. I felt a sensation of falling and awakened in the car. The front of the car was on fire. I moved her from leaning on me as she was when I fell asleep, knowing that her body was an empty shell. I had left her above with those beings. Her fi his fi uh, fiance was dead, and they had a shared near-death experience. So that's some uh, pretty powerful evidence right there. Going very quickly in the limited time I have, some of my most recent, um, I consider a line of 12 for the reality of near-death experience. If there's a, now, everyone in this room has got to be thinking, geez, if I'm convinced there's uh, survival, our consciousness goes on, what does that mean? Where do we go? Uh, we just float around, what's next? Well, uh, uh, near-death experiences have some uh, suggestion as to what, so at least qualitatively, might be going on. Certainly an important question I have on my mind is, if there's an afterlife, is, is there a God? Well, I think we've seen some very powerful evidence that there's that afterlife. Oh, here we go. I think this is the last one of these. But here's a God. So this is not, again, how we did the research. Here's God. Then just follow the life. The light is peace. Okay. Uh, so I published it in my most recent book, God and the Afterlife, some evidence. We'll get into that briefly. The graphics are solely due to Jody because she thought it would be cool, my wife. Uh, reviewed all NDEs shared sequentially over about three years, methodology, first person NDEs, um, NDE scale, just a methodology. I reviewed all NDEs that described an awareness or encounter of God or said G-D that occurred only during their near-death experience and not at any other time. I found 277 near-death experiences describing that awareness or encounter during their experience. Interestingly, encountering God during a near-death experience obviously is not uncommon. And again, what impressed me was a striking consistency across all these hundreds of people describing God. It seemed to be uh, separate from con prevailing conventional religious beliefs. Again, I said it's not uncommon. There's the key question I asked in the most recent version of the survey. Uh, during your experience, did you encounter any specific information or awareness that God or a supreme being, supreme <coughs> being, being straight out of the dictionary for God, either does or does not exist. I asked it in binary form because I knew the skeptics would say, you're only asking if they encountered God, information about God. You didn't ask if there's information that there's no God, so I asked it that way. Here's the statistics right there. We had a narrative response after this, and I can assure you, the text box following this question, essentially everybody answering yes was saying yes, they actually did encounter information or awareness that God exists. In other words, they were not saying they encountered information that God does not exist. 
Um, is the consistency observed in, in, when God is encountered in a near-death experience explainable by pre-existing religious or cultural belief? Very good question. I don't think so, from my evidence. Uh, atheists may encounter God, uh, and, and we have uh, about a dozen of them that describe that. Very young children may encounter God that are not, have not thought much about God or don't have a preconceived notion of what God would be. Very commonly, God was d described as not what they expected from their earthly life. Uh, they often would use the terms unearthly for what they encountered. Religious background, and I ran the statistics on this, uh, whether they were a liberal, moderate, or conservative fundamentalist had no statistical correlation at all with whether they encountered God. Again, the life changes they had after they encountered God certainly suggested that they had God. Clearly, I mean, evidence of survival off the scale as far as I'm concerned. We have powerful evidence that there's survival, uh, that near-death experiences are real, the skeptics, uh, all explanations that have, people have tried for literally decades cannot explain these other than what people that have had these near-death experiences personally believe, and that it was a real visit to an unearthly realm of existence. Thank you very much. After itemizing all of the benefits, do you recommend not trying this? <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, I recommend, I don't try, this is not something you try at home. Uh, yeah, near-death experiences should not be induced. In fact, I would be suspicious from, from my uh, research on this that if someone tried to induce an NDE, that they would not be successful. Um, one of the near-death experiencers encountered God during their near-death experience and was basically asking, why me? Why did I, you know, why did I have a near-death experience that was so blissful and wonderful? And God's response, I think, was revealing and said, and is almost exactly, quote, love falls on everyone equally. This is simply what you needed to live your earthly life. So I think NDEs are basically a gift. I think that was the Rosetta Stone of understanding why some have NDEs and some don't, and why some have different content. Yes? Uh, please clarify something about your survey. It sounds like you're doing online surveys, and how do you verify that the people who fill them out actually have had NDEs? Okay. The, uh, anticipating a question, you know, how do we... Uh, we go. We spend a lot of effort to minimize the risk of falsified NDEs. If anyone's interested in that, they can take a look. Um, people spend a huge amount of time answering over 140 different questions and filling out a huge narrative. Um, if we have a few falsified near-death experiences, if they are so uncommon as I believe they are, less than a few percent for people to go through all that. By the way, they're not recognized by name when they're posted on the NDE. They gain absolutely nothing monetarily or in terms of recognition. Uh, we believe the consistency is so overwhelmingly there from those that share their experiences honorably and with integrity that uh, we believe it's a real thing. Furthermore, what we're observing in our very large group of near-death experiences seems to be strikingly consistent with what other researchers and what other organizations are seeing when they ask for near-death experiences and uh, post their accounts as well. So I'm, I'm confident that this is, uh, that this is a real thing. Yeah. Um, I, I used to describe it as going into a shamanic state when being type 1 diabetic, my blood sugar would go very, very low. It's almost like I'd be lifted out into a cloud. My, my feeling was that it was very gradual. It wasn't in one state or not. So I'm wondering if there's some studies on areas of the brain that light up when people are having near-death experiences and if there's any uh, work with how to stimulate this kind of sensory awareness for the living. Yeah, great, great questions. Um, there's no work, work done, to the best of my knowledge, on like functional imaging of people having a near-death experience. Of course, this is unexpected. They're critically ill, and so our, medically speaking, we're all worried about resuscitating them. Um, so it would, be, it would be fascinating if somebody could, could actually do that. There was at least one study that did EEG measurements on a group that had NDEs and, and did not, and, and suggested there might be a difference in the temporal lobe. But, I think what you've suggested there is a very uh, important and significant area that I'd like to see a lot more research. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh